Go ahead. Go ahead. Question was, how do you keep your gloves on after four or five hours? The guy I work with sweats like in that that symptom picture. Yeah. And he can half an hour take his glove out and it'll drip. I have no answer to that. Yeah. If your gloves are good, it'll right. run. You put your hand up, it'll go up your arm. You sweat. Okay. Nothing you can do. If you don't have you can't have breathable gloves that prevent the chemical. All right, listen. Uh, somebody wants to know about the label. This is my thing, Acrony. You can take this thing off. Remember what I told you. Only the type is a hell of a lot smaller. And let's see. Here we go. Glyphosate. Where's Tom? Tom? Yeah, he's right back there. Bob's got a question for you. Hey, Mike. Aquanid is 53%. Thank you. All right. And uh, uh, Rodeo is 47 or 51, I think. So it's close enough. So basically, the walk away ratio is two ounces per gallon of water, freshly mixed, that for, for any of those professional mixes. If you're buying Roundup, which is 18%, and sometimes 50% in Roundup Pro, you gotta read the label and go according to that. Uh, I think regular Roundup, you might want as much as six ounces per gallon of the 18% mix. Well, yeah, well, you gotta got read the label. Gotta read Don't the label. Don't make me say that's what you do. Your goal is to get to a 2% formulation, though. For our purposes, we that's, found that extremely it. effective. The effectiveness varies with the season after the middle of July, but preferably August or September when it's not in blossom. Uh, maximum foliar canopy display for absorption and downward movement. A still day. 60 degrees or, or higher in temperature, I've read in the NRCS documentation that would, too. That would be reasonable. And uh, question. Okay, you know, what do you suggest for blues if you have a heavy dew? In other words, you go out to do an application in the morning and there's a dew. Do you just delay it or do you do it? Well, being all the, in the rest of you. I get up late, so by the time I get out, sun's up and it's usually a nice time of the year so it's usually dry, but if you get this October, September, October, you start to have a lot of dewy mornings. Um, since you want to spray to glisten, glisten, not drip. If it's already glistening with dew, don't spray because you're going to have to do an exchange of the water that's there with the one you're putting on. So wait till it's dry like this. And I never got, you know, because it's too much to talk about, but spray to glisten. Remembering that if you spray to drip, you're just wasting your chemical because it goes on to the soil and is rendered ineffective. Does not kill the roots. Now, page six of Aquanine. Desired volume, one gallon, 25 gallons, or 100. Gives you 0.75%, 1%, 1.2, 5%, 1.5% or one and a half, 5%, no 2%. So you gotta take one and one. So for a one gallon, it's 1.33 ounces. Then you go times 10. That's the whole deal. Anybody want bug spray? Okay. Um, this thing is a very, this is good. I mean, I'm always amazed when I open it up. Environmental hazards, it's on page two. Don't contaminate water. Don't treat it, oh, treatment of aquatic weeds can result in oxygen depletion. But it doesn't kill aquatic weeds, only leaves that are floating on top, and it's a slow killer. But they put that in there. Terrestrial use, do not apply directly to water. 
or areas where surface water is present or to intertidal areas. In case of spill or leak, soak it up and remove to a landfill. Is a landfill? No, I don't think so. Physical, chemical hazards, direction for use, all of that stuff is in here. I really say, if you haven't looked at this, part of it is what it kills. And, geez, don't do that, Bob. <laughs> I want to find out, perennial weed, what are we killing here? What's it called? Japanese Is it knotweed? <coughs> Is it Japanese knotweed? Is it polygonum? So I go under the K and the J. These are under perennial. Under the P. Oh my God. Woody brush and trees. It's not listed so far. Uh, I'm doing this for you because I didn't have this in my possession last night. A lot of times it's listed under knotweed. Hmm? In, in some references, it's just knotweed as opposed to. Yeah, but there's no. I go in the K, H, I go E, H, I, kudzu, the only K. Okay. So, you know. <laughs> so here we are telling you what to do. And, and the Nature Conservancy, and, and you go to the chemical guys, they all tell you, why isn't it on the label? I'm not going to get into that. I just want you to know, if you want to read this, you can. That's why I wanted to bring that out, because I have read that, and I have not seen it in there. This is Signet Plus, which is uh, limoline. Limonene, le, limonene, alcohols, ethoxylated soybean oil. So this is a vegetable oil that has a lemonine in it and alcohol. Okay, works great. Works great for uh, aquatic weeds. So it actually lasts on a chemical in the water because it's also tying up with the chemical. This is the aquanine here. And lastly, this is, this is, I put the glove on when you make stupid noses left and right. Because I keep taking them off. I like to put them on in the same hand. Oh, I'll do it for you. Take it from Big Y Pharmacy, waterproof bag. Now, already I can see a little smudge right there. And I gotta be careful, hope that's dry. Sometimes I I clean my truck up so well that I don't have You got it on your truck. No, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna give a, give a talk today, so I wanted my truck clean. But when I open this thing up, I don't use my, my fingers. I go to where it says press, and then push it up a little bit, and I pour it in. We're not going to do that today. We're only going to use clean water. Then you close it, and you put it back in the oatmeal thing. And we all know that's where it is. Okay. Notice the gloves. I know. So, I'll give, if you were my assistant, then you can do it for me. Need an assistant? Um, take this one out first and hold it up and tell me what's, what's wrong with it. Sediment? What's on the bottom? Uh, Elodia, something like that? Yeah, it's just green. You leave it jug around too long, you're going to start to grow some algae. You put that into your sprayer, three gallon or even this, and you got to be careful because then you're going to start to clog your nozzle. Go to the one with the red, please. 
And since I, I'm cheap, I'm not gonna go not gonna for, ditch the gloves. Yeah, stop, stop. That, that's now watch. Okay, do it again. Right there. Good. Damn it. Give me one good one. Okay, done. Now, I tested my machine. I always tell everybody. Um, I know Christian uses electricity from his cigarette lighter, or whatever it is. I use a battery because I'm a boatman and I can't bring my truck into the water. You hear that? I know it works. And the reason I know it works is I set up my system here. Just, let's see if I'm going to be a liar. This is a dirty, this is a dirty, but I use it, you know. I'm just going to give a little squirt. See that? It's live. See this? It's still live. Somehow, it didn't lock it, but at least it doesn't go, go full. So are you going to run out some length and demonstrate the foliage? Oh yeah, we're going to do that. Yeah. I'm going to... Disconnect, unload my gun, and because I'm a lazy guy, let me put all this down here. These gloves are for you. Then the die, get it out of the way, and the label. These masks are for you. We're not using this, I'm not going to use any of this. What we're going to do, show you how I do it. I think it's important. I use a short gun all the time, but I know that I'm going to have to run from that end to here. Now, I would never hook this hose up to do this job. I would start right over there where his truck is, and I'd walk along, and my driver would drive, and I'd do my stuff. But I wanted to show you, if you're going to do this, distance. I mean, it was only two of you guys We do the truck. So I have a system here. Yeah, that's a good thing. All right. This is, everything is tight. The other day I went over and I did every, every uh, screw because the last thing I want to have happen is that when one of you guys pulls the hose, you pull it apart. Do you want me to feed you some hose? Well, if everything goes right, it'll come right off the truck. If it doesn't, you can stay in here and be my wrangler. That pump, by the way, is currently priced at about 360 bucks at Tractor Supply Company. We've got that very one at the town crew in Canaan and seems to have held up so far pretty well. We haven't put taxed it very much. Pretty soon we're gonna run out of knotweed. Maybe we'll have a used uh, sprayer for you oh, guys. Dream on, <laughs> dream on. Dream on. 360, yeah. Very, it, it, yeah, very reasonable. They make a less expensive one, which is like a 15 gallon that works on a, a ATV type of uh, uh, tractor. And uh, quite honestly, 15 gallons might be enough. Um, when we did the monster knot we patched down behind the West Cornwall garage, we used uh, a tank and a half to two tanks, if I recall. Does that sound about right, Bob? I think we, it was... we used more than one tank, but that was huge. Can I bring um, my own water? Yeah, okay. listen, that's key. Like that. These two and a half gallon jugs, when you run out of glyphosate, save the jug. It's a good way to carry. So Bob's got uh, eight of those. That means he's got uh, 10, 20 gallons right there. Almost enough to refill his tank in uh, pretty handy cartons. Okay. This is connected to that. 
this, connected to this, to that. I look, make sure I have my washer in there. This is all couplings, hose couplings. Now, you want to spend money? Spend money. You can get, you know, all kinds. But, how long is the hose going to last? I thought it only lasted me, you know, a year or two. It's been about six years. Yeah. But I take care of my hose. I rinse them out. I let them drain down my driveway. And I store them out of the sun. All right, I'm connected, ready to roll here. But I need uh, somebody else. Let's see. I don't have enough water in here. So I take the jacket off. You want me to put some water in? No, no, let's get one of these guys. Somebody come out, grab a jug. Let's put... Uh, Mike. Let's put 10 gallons in here. You might want to climb right up there. No, no, just pick... No, no, I can get up there. Strong. No, pick it up. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> yeah, let's see. We get somebody else. Hey, Rick, come on. You always wanted to do this. <laughs> Just don't, don't spill it. Remember, this is only water. So it might be recommended that when you're dealing with liquids, you've got your eye protection on, uh, so you're not splashing something back in your face suddenly off of a contaminated. Uh, would that be uh, your strategy, uh, native habitat restoration? Yeah, blue in there. yeah when you're mixing. Yeah, probably from the diet. Yeah, and quite honestly, yeah, just yeah. when you're dealing with liquids, whether it's water, you just, you, you know, you, you get said, water on you, you're just not sure. Why is it sure blue in my tank? Uh -huh. I clean this tank, but okay. even though I'm down to, I'm down to almost uh, nothing in there, I did have glyphosate from the job we did at the Norfolk City Meadows using Akronit. So, so, so far we have five gallons. Uh, somebody else, come out and grab these. Let's get 10 gallons. I need volunteers. volunteers. Hey, Jim. Nobody wants to work today? Here. So okay, you here you go. You, got you want to put some gloves on? <laughs> you want gloves? Donnie, here you go, Jim. I was waiting for him. Okay, yeah. back. You got like Grab bees that. all over this. Would you normally spray that with the, with the Say that loud. Well. Here's his question. You got you got bees all over on here? Would you normally spray that with the honeybees or whatever bees you got there? No. No. Mike Simmons raises a question uh, about the bees. Now are you observing bees there, Mike? I saw a few. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a cloudy, cool day, so the bees aren't out. If it was intense sun, that you might see more bee activity. But the DOT, Steve Geddes, has his uh, hand rule. No spraying of knotweed when in blossom. It's the safe way to go. It's the best way to stay out of trouble. Um, the demonstration that Christian will do once we're finished with the foliar demonstration of stem injection doesn't raise that question because we're not applying the herbicide onto the blossom. We're injecting it into the stem. So stem injection, I guess I should say, for the benefit of the land trust people who might be working in sensitive areas or on the riparian area more than the town crews might be, uh, stem injection is often a preferred method on the shoreline of a brook before you get to a certain setback area where, because of efficiency and costs, you're shifting to foliar spray. Um, and let me finish here. Bob, you're back on. Thank you. Uh, you still got to put chemical in, right? So let's see. You're pretending you're putting chemicals in. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> you're going to be the chemical guy. Grab a pair of gloves, put the gloves on. Put the gloves on now. <laughs> <laughs> I always have to tell, I say, Hans, God damn it, wear your gloves. If you remember me from school, that's probably what I had to say a lot of times. Wear your safety glasses. How come you don't have a jacket? You didn't bring a pencil? Yeah, those are other things to remember. Always wear long sleeves. I actually like wearing a sweatshirt with a hood that I can pull up over my head 
Um, I would say, for my purposes, in spraying with glyphosate, if I'm not using a mask, depending on how much I'm doing, I can feel a little sensitivity in my mucal membranes back here. It's just because of the pH. But I simply put on a dust mask, and that's, that does the job. Go ahead. Okay. We got a mix. He's got it. got his gloves. And we're going to go to the second case over there, pull out one of those uh, red top jugs. Let's make a believe this is chemical. And uh, how many gallons did we put in? 100% juice. Yeah. Okay, how many gallons are in there? 10. 10? And what if we say we were going to put in 1.33 ounces to the gallon? That's, that's about one ounce. I mean, that's about one percent. No, that, yes, it is. Ooh. Harry, you're very good. See? See what happens? That's why you need another person. Holy. We're going to do a, we're going to multiply 1.33. I do 1.28 because 1.28 is 1% of one gallon. And then I multiply yeah, but, by 2, 2.5. But we're going to, we're doing a, we're going to do a 5% mix. Oh, okay, yeah. So, you want to do the math? 2.5, 4, uh, 5, 6, it's about 7 ounces a gallon. About? Yeah, no, I mean not 6.82. I'm, I'm breaking, I'm breaking, I didn't bring my, my oh, calculator. Yeah, yeah, sure, I'm sorry, if you want it absolutely exactly. Exactly, sure. because absolutely. if I do it sloppily. No sloppy. You, and you know those gallons, are supposed to be two and a half, but when Hans fills them. 6.4 ounces, 5% per, per gallon. 6.4. So now you want to do how many gallons? We, so well, I'm going to look at this. We supposedly have 10, but I think there's more than that. If it's 10, it's going to be half a gallon. Can you read it on That's a water, but you're, 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 you're not actually, you're mixing with water. Probably. Yeah. Yes. No, no. Uh, there should there be a stripe right down there. I should tell you how many gallons. 15. I'll bet that. Rough it out, Bob. It's 10. 15 gallons? Yeah. Is the next one up? 17. Yeah, 15 gallons. This thing has 15 gallons. In. Why? I told you I had to test it this morning. None of the jugs were knocked out. Right? They're all full. So I put water in from the greenhouse hose. So there's 15 gallons in there. So you got. She'll do the math. 15 gallons. 96 ounces. 96. 96. 5%. 496 ounces in there. So only goes up this. So we'll go to. Uh, wait. No, it's. No, wait. 9.6. Yeah. Point point six. So you six. hold. You no, hold your finger 32. You want 5%? Yes. In 15 gallons, 96 ounces. So you hold your finger at 32 ounces. Sure, you want 10, uh, 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 5 percent. Typically, yeah. we're using two to two and a half. You want to go two and a half? Yeah. Two. So cut it in half. So it's 46 uh, ounces. 48. 48. 48. But you could also see what you're getting into here now. This is the beauty of this workshop. You have to realize that. But well, we only want to use 5%. No, we don't want to use 5%. We want we can't use one. We don't want to use one and a half. So let's take the 1.33, make it for two ounces, for 2%. 2% is 2.56. Because I don't know why they say 1.33. No, because this has more. Oh, I see. It's a different concentration. Two point, I mean, two times 1.33 is 2.66. And and times five. Times. No, times fifteen. Sorry, close my app down. Uh, two point six six times fifteen equals forty ounces. Thirty nine point nine. Forty ounces. Forty ounces. I'm gonna put my finger 
kind of see that where that is there? Let me get my finger. Yep, gotcha. Right there. That jar is probably only 32 ounces, isn't it? So, as an alternative way of doing a calculation for my four gallon backpack sprayer, I put in eight ounces, two ounces times four. If I'm doing a tank, um, I'm doing uh, eight ounce, eight gallons, I'm going two cups. And um, I don't get into the uh, calculator. And that gives me 2%. The literature that's in your packet refers to 2% 2 to 2.5, and some people use 3 to 5%. Um, we try to go with the quote-unquote most judicious use of herbicide, and quite honestly, Christian, we've had remarkable results on uh, one Canaan roadside at 2%, that we treated last year, he found one sprig this year. So I barely see a reason to go above two or 2.5. We're gonna put this bread of sticker in, you know, and I look at this, I say, well, what the hell, it just says uh, per 100 gallons. There's nothing in here. So you're gonna have to go look this up. But it turns out to be one point, Seven, one point seven ounces. That's too much. It's, it's a different. I think you told me about a half an ounce a gallon, and that's what I've been using. That yeah, that would, that's more like it. So yeah. I have it written on my thing, but you can't find it on the label, and you're going to ask your guys to put the right amount in. How much per hundred is it? Hmm? How much per hundred gallons is it? You ready? This is a smart guy. It says here. Do the math. One pint to two quarts. One pint to another the variation. One pint or two quarts per hundred gallons. So if you went to the pint per hundred. Six ounces per hundred. Yeah. So one point six for ten. That's right. Okay. One point. That's a good number because that's the number that I probably follow for ten gallons. And we have fifteen. One point six times two. One and a half. 2.4. 2.4, yeah. You got your jug? Not this. We use fake stuff. <laughs> My point is that we, you know, you think you we can bang this. We only water here. So, <laughs> so Sari, what surfactant do you typically use with Rodeo in a uh, like wetland it? setting? It says two uh, and a half. Go well, right up. The number of Oh, okay. It varies with season. I, for me, it does. But, yeah. Um, okay. But my my old favorite is induced. I buy from Helen Chemicals. And it's called again what? Induce. Induce. Okay. Okay. Bob has added the uh, surfactant. And you're going to put a cap on that tank? No. Why? I don't know. Okay. Let me tell you. I'm not going to put a cap on it because I'm not a total AH, you know, arm hole. Uh, a leak, Bob. Sometimes, remember this is 150 feet of air. Now, unless you keep it, here we go. You hear it? She told me so, sir. So this is the next season we have kind of seen now in the tank, putting the pump on in a recycling mode. I gotta fill the hose. And filling the hose at the same time. You're agitating the chemical into the water. Well, if there was a full hose, I would have done that immediately. Yeah. Like my second batch. So I didn't Bob realize. is going to demonstrate that. And then All right, ready? Uh, Smith is going to demonstrate There's the water, water in his battery-powered backpack. Anybody want to read that gauge? 
This is about 75 pounds. Watch. So I mix it all up. And if I had dye in there, I'd wait. See, it's coming out like water. If I had dye in there, I'd want to wait till the hose got completely full with mixed material, and I'd keep mixing. <laughs> Otherwise, somebody's going to get nothing, and somebody's going to get an overdose. Pretty good. So. Alright. If, if this works right, we're gonna, I'm working that way, because we're going to start at the end. That's why I put it on a hose, showing you the tough part. So if I walk, and I did my figure eights right, I don't want to get a hose real. This should come right out. You know, I just could not convince. I could not convince that that's what you did. Right, I just sales. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but no, I tried. But some people are just, you know, they they just say what us. All right, this area is a virtual wonderland of invasive problem weeds. We're only dealing with this stuff that's in flower, which we would never do. And I had a question earlier about leaving my gallons of water in the truck, you know, for two days, three days in the jug, would that hydrolysis change the pH or the ability of the water to act with the chemical? So far, no, but I am the person that always says, get fresh water. In the morning, fill your tank, fresh water. Bring fresh water with you. Now this, this gun, remember that long one I had, my hand would be already hanging down. This one, it's like a, a Colt, you know, it's handy. So, I give myself a little test. I want to see what my range is going to be. Oh, pretty neat. What do you think? Right. Normally, Bob would have a spotter on the other side to see where that uh, liquid is landing. And I, Peter Pacone, you want to be his spotter? <laughs> out to see what now? Yeah, see, see where yeah, his, Bob. when you shoot up there, Bob. So listen, that's one point I would like to emphasize, is that we know where our chemistry is landing. And uh, we're trying to you see the, the uh, target, yeah, right. the intended target yeah, only. And I not have I'm going over the top. Three quarters of the way. Oh, okay. You're making it three quarters right here. Three quarters? Yeah, I'm only getting about right here. So he's giving me the word. I didn't get the whole deal. Yeah, so for two reasons. We don't want to spray what's unintended, but we want to try to get the full target that is intended. So something like this, you'd have to circle around it, get it from the other side. Yep. In other situations, we found that we can only get so far at a uh, cemetery in East Canaan. Uh, we can only reach so far. We got to go back. There's basically untreated knot. We just back from the arc of the spray gun. Okay. This is where Tom's pink ribbon would go. When we got our range, we put it there, we go back later. I can see my glisten. Right, so you can see what's wet, is what you're saying. Yep. And so basically, a lot of that we. So Bob, you want to put some of the uh, volunteers uh, from the town crew on that gun? Well, I'm going to show you. You can change your nozzle with the glove and you can come through the edge. Okay, so the nozzle setting that he's at now, 
that's one where you actually want to be sure to have your mask on because it's this well, not, was, not really. Pardon? Not really. Because uh, they're never going to do it. Uh, I saw this. If the wind is... If the wind is blowing... There's no breeze here. So if the wind is blowing, you're going to have a problem. If it's coming down that driveway, and I'm going like that, it's going to go right in my face. That's why I always give it a little shot. Any wind? Yeah, yeah. Now remember, drift is in relation to the droplet size, which is also going to be predicated on the amount of pressure. So if you increase the pressure and you tighten up the orifice, you're going to get a lot more drift. Drift is bad because drift then goes somewhere else and gives you a problem. You can put material in your water that will reduce drift. So I'm, I always stop down here and find that little guy that I didn't get. And then I go over another 10 feet. And if anybody else wants to try this, it's right here. We got a, no volunteers? Well, come on up. Get a, Get some gloves, please. Is it good stuff in there, Bob? That's just water, huh? It's not perfect water because my tank had probably a quarter cup of diluted stuff that we kept running through the hose. So, but the dye. This is not blue. And he'd be wearing a mask too, right? Yeah. And, well, and glasses, right? You have glasses? No. Want to get some goggles and a, <laughs> and a mask? Now in a lot of situations, I like to spray from the bottom up. I have arguments with my other guys. I like to do this. Look it over, see where I missed. His arms. All right? Long sleeve shirt. Right, but anyhow. This is water. Cameron? Cameron. Cameron. Yeah. You can just hold this. Don't point at anybody. Um, why don't you give a little squeeze? Now, do it again. Right now. You might want to open this. Up. Right there. Go away. See your range? Yeah. Now don't worry about that tree, because that's an Alanthus. That's its mother right up above, making more seeds. Yeah. Now, if you hit that tree. Robert. Guys, that's that's a tree of heaven up there, Danielle. See it? It's in flower up there, a seed. Alright. Now, let me just watch spray. We have all these critics. They'll tell you what you're doing wrong. Spray to glisten, don't spray to drip. Uh, wait a minute. Let me feel that. Yeah, see, that's why if you're going to do that, you want to be down here. Like that. And then spray a little bit in there. Go ahead, more. Ready? Just keep, watch what you're doing. Now to get the distance, open up your nozzle. 
There you go. Right? Try to try to get it way up, way over the back. Open, open, open. That's it. Good. Now right, walk down and do another. Anybody else want to suit up? Left and right. Don't wiggle through. Just watch your screen. See your screen. The screen is right where you are. You want to get not as steady. Don't do too much because you can't see what you're doing. Can you do that whole piece? Lock the piece. Now, if you need to close it up to get in there again, can you open it up to me? You never put Okay. Now look at your work. See so you miss that one. And you put it. That's okay. No, 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 right. Good. But like golden rods. Thank you. Thank you. All right, what we've done here, since all of you are supposed to do this, but you're not. This is not cool. getting Come in certificate. closer, let's so we can hear Bob better. Uh, we've done a little bit here, pretty much to glisten, a little bit of drip. Got a problem, we got a lot of distance and close up. So you got a lot of shutting it down. And then you got a lot of opening it up. Shoot it up again, John. Bob. Let me get through. So it would stand a reason you'd come down here, pick up about 20 feet, do this first, with a wide angle. So it starts to get out of reach, open it up. Don't kill that bittersweet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you want to get it wouldn't down. have much effect on it, but it's like you said. And you've got to use your eyes. You can't have a spotter with you all the time. So I look and I see what I missed. Because you're going to be back here. And you're going to say, <laughs> oh yeah, I remember. That's when I spot the mosquito. <laughs> Bob, can I ask a question? Yes, you may. Um, how far do you think you can effectively and safely spray, what kind of distance would that can you get? Well, let me just check my machine. Christian, what's the reach of your tank? Maximum. 25 feet? Yeah, they're about, yeah, about, yeah, about 25 it's a, it's a, it's feet. It's about 25 <laughs> feet. Yeah. But I'm thinking about with this particular um, I'd say spray. Feet. To 30. Yeah. Yeah. Today, if somebody wants to walk out the distance, I'm running 60 pounds. And remember, every 50 foot of hose gives me friction, so I'm losing distance. I can go and shoot this thing in here. It might make that go. But if you wanted to see, I'd stand here, but if I put that other hose on, just at 20 feet, this is probably, what, 40 or 50? 30. We're going to argue about it, right? <laughs> oh, 
12, times 2 is 24, and add another half a, half. Yeah, you're right. Probably 30. 24, and, and 30. As, as a comparison with that 25 to 30 feet, uh, we've got two backpack sprayers, a battery powered one on, on Mike Schmidt, and this baby, uh, the cheap one, um, and you can see what I'm able to get there pretty well. Same That's thing. water, by the way. That's not a bad arc, although uh, you, you you do have that risk of uh, tennis elbow when you're getting into this real heavy. Oh, right. to, to the whole piece. Okay, so Bob starts at the bottom and works up. Mm -hmm. I prefer to start at the top. And I think I would, this is water. And I like being able to see uh, my arc, and I might, if I had a pickup truck, be preferring to stand in the back bed so I have a better angle of view. Um, then I'm, and I, let's say I'm working one arc left to right, and I'm coming across, and then back again. And then I might back up here a little bit. And then maybe come in close to finish off the bottom. Okay, Mike, put that, bring that tank of yours over. So I'd say, looking at it, there's a little more there. There's a little more there. Pretty good coverage in terms of wetting. Let's see what this thing does. Not anywhere near like that. You got the wrong nozzle on there. He has a fan nozzle. What is, you got a different nozzle? No. Okay, so that's not gonna give you a comparison of reach. So that's uh, used for, let's say, I would say smaller plants nearby or whatever. Okay, I only asked him yesterday to bring in this tank and he didn't check the nozzle, but that's definitely specific. I carry on my backpack, an old film canister. They don't make them anymore. Taped to the shoulder strap. And in there, I have a straight stream, a fan, and a cone, and an adjustable. So there's always usually one of those on my sprayer. That one is... Uh, Tom, is your, Tom, is your nozzle adjustable? Take that wand yeah, off. This, this is an adjustable oh, nozzle. This, this is what came with the rig. This whole backpack system I'm wearing was $40? 40 dollars 38 48 48 Groundworks. Bottom of the line. Kind of like an old Kelty pack. Fits square on your back. No cushion. No ergonomic features. But quite honestly, effective. You know, and my preferences for the wand as opposed to the gun, I, I'd rather have this thing distributing further from my face rather than closer to my body. Um, in fact, um, there's one interesting photo, and I've never tracked it down, of a European application. And I, this guy clearly had a telescoping wand. And he, was, he had his wand out over the top of the stuff, and he was shooting down on it from above. And I, and I like that idea, quite honestly. Well, preferences. I believe in, and we're going to argue with this, I have to be ready for anything whether I'm doing a tree, or I'm doing the ground, or I'm doing distance. So you want to have flexibility. One of these, and I tell this to Christian as well, this is pretty, pretty good, but all you got to do, I won't do this, but step on it once, and you're out you of don't, business. Yeah, it's out of commission. And I've done it, and that's why you see that one I have showing you. I, I crunched it, so I don't want to crunch. If this was a sumac instead of an Alanthus, we would be really careful, quite honestly, to spray around it. We've been dealing with that very issue at the North Campus at HVRHS, where our preserved trees were red cedar and sumac. We wanted to get rid of everything else because everything else was an invasive. So I would say broad sweeping, even when you're using this machine, uh, you want to be very um, 
you want to be a sharpshooter. Um, and when we had native habitat restoration do a Washini Park thing, boy, Dennis O'Connor, he nailed every plant bullseye. And, uh, you know, the, the kill was impressive. The non-kill was impressive. So, um, That's where they backpack. That was with a hose uh, and a 50 gallon sprayer, okay. as a matter of fact. And he, his assistant was dragging the rose, running the hose, uh, so he didn't have to drag the whole hose. That guy was taking up the weight of the hose and trailing 25, 30 feet behind him. Um, I guess, uh, okay, so. Christian has a uh, injector demo and Bruce Bennett does, and we're going to do that over at the left point of that mound and talk a little bit about that cultural control over there. What we would say to Tim is, boy, Tim, if you get yourself that 25-gallon tank, get it on your truck. In this case, fill it up with 25 gallons, so you're going to use two gallons per two ounces per gallon, so 50 ounces of glyphosate, right? And uh, just wet all this down. You're going you're gonna to go through that amount of chemistry. Would you agree? Yeah. And I would say for any of you, when you get back on your town cruise, check your, hey, check the place where you're buying fill from. You don't want to buy fill for 25 bucks a yard or whatever it is that's contaminated. That stuff is if it were in a different country, would not be legally permitted. It's considered a controlled waste. Um, in your, on your own town properties where you're getting fill, you, you want to manage this. Now, Tim, there's, there's a knotweed outbreak over at your transfer station next to a little pile of gravel. It probably got picked up from here and dumped over there. Uh, you want to grab that. You got that one behind one of your sheds down at the town garage. You know, sanitize your immediate work area. And quite honestly, if you're just getting into it initially at this time, of the, at this year, practice. Hey, this is the best practice location you could ask for. You know, you're not out there conceivably screwing up in the public right-of-way. We you're, were going to use chemical, but I, I remember we were talking about doing this whole thing with all of you here. And then I said, oh, wait a minute. We can't do that. It's gotta be, gotta do it with water. It's gotta be done safely. That's what we're really selling here. And uh, safety, not only you, but for your community. And we don't wanna destroy any other habitat. Maybe Tim will invite us back next uh, Is September to see Christian? the results of his sanitation. Do you have the injector? Yeah. <laughs> can I do it now? Yeah, we're gonna do it over there. Why don't we go? Okay. So, okay, <laughs> grab your stuff All and right. let's walk over there. And I'm going to grab five. Okay. Let's head over here. I need to get next to the mirror for them. I'll give you two minutes. Yep. We'll see how it works out. Hey, David, could you grab me my empty jug there? Oh, they got full spring. Yeah. And develop it. This is a good commercial for a ah, Pretty damn good, thank you. Good question. Bite pruner, do you want a hand lopper or this? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Right, mugwort everywhere here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll give you something good enough. Can you, can you work with this? Yeah. Sure. Not really. Need a little mugwort. My toolkit's in my other room. Okay, Christian. Right. Okay, so I'm going to bring the group around, fanning out to the right of my vehicle here. So this is a uh,
this pile of what appears to be topsoil, and where's, where's Tim? Yep. Appears that there was more recently, considering the elevation of the growth, a scoop of material taken from here. This is, you know, two foot material versus five or six foot. So it seems highly probable. Why don't you bring yourself around to your left, please? Uh, that a source of contaminant has been translocated from this site to some other site. Um, even this beautiful clean gravel here, notice what's behind it. There's not we dropping seeds into the gravel. So there's even a risk of contamination there. Uh, Christian is going to run up there and do an injection demo. Right. And so with injection, there's a number of tools that you could use that could aid in the effectiveness of the injection. There's actually knotweed injection tools. We were hoping to get one for the time of this workshop. They come out of the UK, and depending on when you order them, they're priced anywhere from $75 to $450 because of demand. Um, so I had ordered a knotweed injector tool a month ago, and they delayed shipping by another month because of the demand. So as an alternative, what I started using last year is a meat injector. Um, you could buy one of these at wherever, Amazon, for $15. Or really in Bar Hardware in Great Barrington or in Torrington. At, at Bed Bath & Beyond, where this one came from. $15. Very cheap. Uh, so what we're going to demonstrate here is we have two stocks there that we could inject. But I would suggest that you never inject at a site like this. You really want to inject at sites with maybe 70 stems or less, maybe 50 square feet or less with large inch, in, uh, inch thick stems so that way you could inject and have a reasonable confidence that all the chemical that you injected is in the plant and going down into the stem. Um, so Bruce is going to hold the rodeo concentrate you want to inject with rodeo concentrate. This is the equivalent of cut and treat for knotweed. And you open up your tool. And with this one, it comes with two um, uh, needles. Um, and it's a syringe type injector. Um, the knotweed injectors are the UK. There's actually a bottle like that that's attached to the device. And with this syringe type injector, the exit hole is at the tip. With the knotweed injector of the United Kingdom, it is a spike at the tip, and there's perforated. It's a perforated syringe edge uh, um, uh, uh, shaft. So when you in, you inject, the holes are inside the stem. There's very minimal risk of getting concentrate out of the plant. So I'm going to attach the larger needle to the injector tool, and I'm going to use an ice pick, which is th this tool right here, which is going to um, actually break the stem so I can put the um, syringe in. I don't want to break the stem with the syringe because what can happen is in this little exit hole, a piece of knotweed can get in there and it could be the dimensions that it's enough to germinate a new plant. So we don't want to be in that business. So I'm going to set this here. And if you could just open that up. You want to make sure that your injector tool can uh, work before you use it. And you want to clean it after every time you use it. And you, so that's a straight rodeo, roughly speaking, 50% glyphosate. The label rate that is defined for stem injection has a limit per stem of five milliliters. So Christian's gun is calibrated in five millimeter or approximately half ounce uh, quantities um, because in environmentally sensitive areas and riparian areas and because of the evidence of success at two milliliters per stem, we're averaging out two stems per five, so two and a half milliliters per stem. Right. So here I actually have enough. It's dripping, by the way. Yeah, enough in the syringe for three stems. I, okay, don't get um, it on the handle of that uh, yeah, other it's not, tool, Tom. please. So I'm going to go up uh, here, and there's two stems that are about a half inch in diameter. 
and you could see there's nodes to the plant and in, in between these nodes is a hollow chamber and we want to get this concentrate inside that hollow chamber so that it will sit there and absorb into the root system of the plant. So we want to pick one of these chambers that's close to the ground but is long enough that will hold enough herbicide necessary to actually achieve control. So with this stem here, I'm going to pick this node which has about four inches um, that are available to us and pierce it towards the top of the node. And now that that's broken, I could put my tool in and inject. Okay, so you can see, for example, up at the firehouse, there's one little cluster that's this big. Perfect candidate for uh, uh, injection. Or, in the aftermath of foliar treatment, the previous year, when we had some re-sprouts along the river by the Houstonic, by the covered bridge, Hey, you can get, we can inject those. You can inject down to a half inch diameter. Um, it's a lot easier with a more mature, you know, inch, inch and a quarter inch stem. By the time the stems get up to that size, at this time of the year, there's quite a bit of woodiness to them. So I've even tried it using a little portable, you know, battery powered drill. Zap it in there and then stick in the injector. Sari has used, and you have used, injector guns, which are a little heavier duty than the syringe. Okay, Christian, finish what you're saying. <laughs> so, now I'm moving on to this next stem, and this is a half inch diameter stem. So that's the, for, for size, you could look at this and reference it. So if you're seeing knotweed out in the field, this is the minimum of what you want to inject. If there's anything smaller than this, like these little guys here, they're not injectable, don't worry about them. But if you see something like this, and you maybe see three, five, seven, 14 stems, you can spend the time injecting it. So again, I'm gonna to go towards the top of the section here and inject. <coughs> okay, yeah, the first half of the growing season, it's, it's very soft and wet. Uh, end of season, like you mentioned, the cellulose gets really hard and stems start to brown. Does that affect absorption of the glyphosate? In other words, the woodier it gets, does that reduce the amount of absorption of transport? Apparently not. Uh, apparently, at the, in the late season, the draw down to the rhizome right. is strong enough that it is working, at least by the demonstration site that Mike Schmidt and Christian and I did last year, which was very specific. Uh, every, every injected stem turned brown three weeks later, whatever it was. Right, and in an ejection site in Norfolk, um, which is where most of the knotweed along the Blackberry River in Canaan came from, um, every stem that I injected, I achieved 100% control. There were other stems that were too small, this size, that re-sprouted in the following year that have to be sprayed. But as far as treating sites that are very small and contained and have these larger diameter uh, knotweed uh, uh, stems, uh, you can achieve very high percentage of control. The rodeo label says specifically on it, you have to treat every stem. So apparently each stem has enough rhizome of its own that if that doesn't get suppressed, um, it'll bounce back. So you need to go for either way, 100% control. Have you tried it on uh, earlier in the season, though, to see how effective that is? I have not, but that would be a worthy experiment to undertake because if we could extend the season for knotweed treatment, um, that would be greatly beneficial because right now, in our part of Connecticut, it's generally uh, August 15th to 1st of September when the blossoms start to fall off, depending on the season. Or yeah, the or even the 15th of September. Right, which is what's happening this year and then to frost. So that gives you, for this season, really only a, a month to effectively treat. Um, if we could expand that out into July, to like July 1st, like it is for bittersweet spread, um, for cut and treat, um, that would be really beneficial. Yeah, I wouldn't see why that wouldn't, I mean, biologically, it would seem, you 
know, plants are expanding their root systems just like they're expanding their, the top of the plant. You've got some movement downward as well. In always, the uh, always the feed. I in mean, the, the Penn feeding State, is going back and forth. In the Penn State University documents that were in your town crew folders, it gives a treatment uh, a bar graph of various windows of activity including treatment. They in Pennsylvania go from mid-July through September. My thinking is uh, ah, I would like to get into later July or August in terms of getting the maximum amount of chemistry into the ground. Uh, but I would, I'm thinking, Christian, you uh, starting in mid-July next year, do some uh, injection sites and, and test that out. Right. Any other questions on injection? It seems like that method is like fighting a forest fire with a squirt gun. I mean, yeah, yeah, it would be. Like, uh, shall we say, this is, <clears throat> with, a, with an injection gun, it's more efficient than what we're doing here with no, two tools. No, I don't think so. I hated the injection gun, frankly. I've done a, I've done a lot of injections um, because when we very first started treating uh, campus for bog, we weren't allowed to do foliar applications and we had, I know, 60 acres of frag mites. 60 acres of frag? Yeah, and we did frag. Injecting frag. Swipe. Hand swiping and injecting frag. Okay. And well, really the point here, going back to the forest fire analogy, you want to use this when the knotweed is campfire size. You know, again, like under a hundred stems. You know, that one site that got established three years ago, and there's a couple stems there. Take this, go over there, get it done within an hour, and it's it's gone. Um, this doing it here would be ridiculous. Um, and it's really only for your benefit, your for demonstration purposes. Like ecologically sensitive areas where you can't do foliar spray, you can do this instead, like on the edges of rivers and water bodies and stuff, right? True, true. Well, we do it, we do it in gardens. So we have perennial borders where plants are coming into the edge of these things, and we'll use the injector in those localized areas in order to be able to stop it that way, and it works. And we've done it in the middle of the summer all the way into the fall, with pretty good success. So, I haven't end of summer, years. meaning what? So, anytime in August, July, August, <laughs> September, October. Yeah, until killing frost. And quite honestly, last year, frost didn't occur till mid October or something. Is yeah, that right? Not correct? Late October. Yeah. Yeah, it was really late. How yeah. far, I mean, how much of a kill will you get just from what you did here? I mean, are you just going to end up killing that one stem, or does it spread out to kill adjacent? I imagine, well, I know for certain that these two stems will not come back. Right. But I imagine because knotweed is a rhizominous plant, this herbicide is going to travel through the rhizomes and we're going to see glyphosate damage on these other um, yeah, so stems next first, year. How, how much do you think that would spread out? Very limited. Right. I would say Very not limited. more than a handful of stems, quite honestly. So just um, within a few inches of, of any treated stem? Right. Right. Basically, you got to treat every stem you got to kill. Basically, I'd say if you had a cluster of ten stems and you treated eight of them, two might well survive. Right. Does that sound reasonable yeah, to you? Yeah, I was going to say really, it's about how interconnected the root systems are. Yeah. Because it's family. It's not. It's not leaching out of the, the, the plant. They have to be connected. Yeah. For now, them typically, to be you know, in a sense, this except that it had possibly been disturbed by uh, payloaders and stuff here, it's conceivable that this is one plant from one initial contaminant. And because, hey, rhizomes, we didn't talk about this, can extend out 65 feet laterally from a single plant and re-sprout. That's another factor when we discuss the inadequacy of mowing. Mowing stimulates lateral bud sprouting and you actually end up with a higher density of stems. And um, so that, that, that underground miracle of this plant, if you will, is um, to be considered with utmost seriousness. Now, Bruce typically is treating, as Christian is saying, small clusters in the, with a injection method. Approximately how, what size? What size areas? Yeah, how so many stems? Small, 10 by 10 or less. 10 by 10 or less, okay. 
So this is a technique, as you're saying, for that could fit under early detection and rapid response. You don't want to wait 10 years and say, oh, I should have done that in 2019. And uh, wow, now it's uh, 200 feet by 50 feet in dimension, not 10 by 10. Um, any uh, further questions before we uh, retire to lunch? Suggestion. Um, as you can see, I'm doing this way up here on a gravel bank. And if I were to keep going, I would have to crawl under here and in, into this area and poke around and inject. My suggestion for the town crews in particular is you don't want to put your most fragile guy on this job because <laughs> this is this this kind of work uh, with so in a knotweed patch where you have no idea what the terrain is underneath. You don't want you don't want to have that guy crawling around. So it should uh, be said that that area b which we worked on behind the West Cornwall garage, which was Phil put in there, including you know tires and wheels and metal. old tanks and metal and was a very challenging thing to walk around on with a four gallon backpack sprayer for the section that I was doing um, where I was using uh, I'm trying to protect uh, some of the vegetation that we didn't want to hit um, yeah so you want to be um, you know wear good shoes wear long pants actually when you're in those any kind of environments like that, you want to do your tick check afterwards too. That Stuff is brushing up against you. Um, ticks are not as likely to be in that uh, monoculture of knotweed than in other mixed shrub understories. But hey, um, that's another precaution, which kind of comes under the safety, uh, you know, crew. <coughs> safety, OSHA type of thing. Does OSHA even deal with ticks and Lyme disease? I have no idea. But it ought to be part of the protocol. Um, David, from a, as a horticulture instructor, your thoughts? On what we're doing here? Well, knotweed in general and invasive management. Let's say, give us a perspective on invasive management at Houstonic Valley Regional okay. High School campus. Well, we've got a project that's what seven years in the works now it was under total collapse forest collapse so you would say in, in certain areas from bittersweet um, we've been doing the cut and treat method with Christian and Tom and Bob um, for the past seven years yeah yeah it's all mapped uh, using GIS technology to map the invasive zones so we have seven or eight zones of management yep um, we're pretty limited to what we can do with class time, but these guys have made it possible for for us to uh, to have a an educational program in invasive management. Yeah, listen, thank you, uh, HVRHS students. You you all ought to get invasive merit badge before you graduate, <laughs> and uh, there's a future in that, quite honestly, because. We're new, intro new introductions of invasives are occurring, coming up from the south. Uh, the unmanaged invasives, as you can see, are keep getting larger and larger. Um, the science is evolving. We understand now better, really, what a disadvantage these plants are to the ecosystem uh, in terms of riparian health, in terms of fisheries, and trout fishing and avian reproduction success. Um, and when you think about knotweed especially, and that's why we're so focused on this in the Housatonic context, you know, we have a extraordinary resource that runs right on the other side of this bottom here and along the shores of our high school. And it is, has the, the potential to be the richest uh, ecological diversity of any habitat between uh, you know Virginia and Maine let's say um, so we're trying to preserve that ecological diversity say something more about that right well when Tom and I first came on the scene going back to how bad it really was we have pictures that we can send to the group but it was completely enveloped by bittersweet autumn olive growing everywhere and we had that we had a forestry mower come in and take everything out to save the sumac 
and the cedars. We only had about 15 cedars left to say, and uh, how many acres? Eight acres, well, in that certain area, one acre. Right, yeah, one acre. Yeah, so yeah. 15 saved plants in one acre that were just completely Plus destroyed. Plus sycamores. And so now that area is 99% controlled. Um, and once in the future, I certainly hope that Tom and Bob and I and others will continue to work with you to educate you more on the other invasives that are harming our ecosystem. Not weed is one, but there's plants like Japanese barberry where there's 120 ticks per acre when there's Japanese barberry present where normally there's only 10 ticks per acre with um, uh, tick-borne disease. So or, that's a good, a, a good example. The talk I gave at Great Barrington on Saturday was called Three Green Aliens. Hey, thanks to your wife. She named it for me. Um, and we looked at a shrub invasive barberry which has the potential to harm people because it hosts those ticks and, and increases the risk of Lyme disease. If this was a barberry infested floor, I would not walk through it, even with DEET to head, head to toe. Um, we looked at bittersweet, the tree killing vine. Okay, those, uh, the canopy of those uh, cottonwoods will eventually be enveloped, will be snuffed out, will die, will collapse, will be a mess. And, um, you know, when we did our, <laughs> in one area down at the high school, there were hardly any trees worth saving because they had all been snagged because of the uh, killing of the crown and the weight of the vines and ice and snow and so forth. They became uh, useless and they had to go on the gigantic burn pile. Um, the shrub uh, and the vine uh, can be treated effectively with a technique that we will only mention which is called cut and treat. Hey, you cut it like this, you take the buckthorn blaster, I've got one in the back of the car, I'm going to show it to you, um, and then we'll wrap up here completely. That's, I guess if we did a follow-up with the uh, cruise of the wild and scenic, we, would, we, we could concentrate on this. So this is a straight glyphosate of concentrate. There's a stamp moistener. The smaller version of this four ounce bottle is a two ounce bottle at Staples to moisten stamps with. You go dab, 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 and you just leave a little film on the freshly cut stem of those vines. We could cut and treat each of those vines and use the equivalent of a teaspoon of glyphosate and save a tree. Hey, we did that at the Mary Moore Preserve in Sharon, where we saved a 48 inch diameter champion chinkapin oak for the state of Connecticut using you know, maybe a half an ounce of herbicide. Can you substitute a, a bingo dauber? I mean, yeah, you can. Yeah. That's I mean, exactly that, that's what, what this is. is. That happens yeah. to be three ounces. Yeah. And this, this sells for six bucks. It's a ripoff, basically. <laughs> but, you know, a three ounce bindo, dump out the ink, put in the glyphosate. Yeah. So, this is, this is a, was a great program. Uh, you know, we, at State Land, we kill a lot of invasives. And, uh, you know, there's 97 invasives, and you guys focused on this one invasive. Yeah. It's really, really neat that you did that because you gave us a lot of ideas and tools. You know, if you look at this whole site, you know, the tree of heaven. Right. Uh, yeah. That's a female clone. You know, there's females and males. And, for example, right down, right down the road at, at Housatonic River Wildlife Management Area, the tree of heaven was taking over that property. It was, it's an old Kent landfill that the state bought with the, uh, the agricultural fields. And uh, if we didn't take, take stand that on killing tree of heaven, which is an upper canopy, you know, it's an upper canopy plant, the knotweed is your shrub herbaceous layer you know there's the herbaceous layers there's a shrub layer and then there's the over canopy that's probably the next species you know you're killing the vines that are pulling down the trees but Atlantis is the next one that if you allow it to grow it will actually take over the canopy of an area right it takes over the overstory the tree right and that's like the oh, culmination God. of when it's destroyed the site when you let Atlantis yeah. so we down at Kent we it took us three years and you can see that plant is cloning and it's, you know, those are probably related. Sure. Like sumacs, 
but yeah. they're clonal as well. Those are another, that's another species that uh, I, we target for management when you prioritize, and uh, and that that's one where we you could girdle, double chainsaw stem, and then we use triclop here yeah. on, on that plant. Uh, I, I, it's on your, on on your Atlantis, bark treatment. Bark treatment. Yeah. Can I make a comment? Yeah. Tree of heaven has a more the word heaven. It does yeah. if you. Yeah, really have the sawdust and your chainsaw operator, yeah. you can breathe in right. that stuff and get what? Yeah, no, it, it's bad, but, but we use axe. Myocarditis. Yeah, but we also use an axe. You can put axe okay. on your chainsaw. Yeah. Be yeah. careful. Yeah, but in, uh, in, 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 in Asia, they use it to make, uh, to make instruments. So there's, it's in, in Asia, it's a lumber. So in its native land, they make uh, music, you know, music uh, oh, yeah. instruments out of it. So yeah, you're right. There could be a danger. Uh, could be but, dangerous. But but you could you could also cut it with a chain with an axe and then treat it. But then it you the call way. the guy to come in, cut it up. They want to make it into firewood, and so the tree service sends out three guys to put the stuff through the chipper and and cut it, and they end up going to the hospital. It's still worth managing. Yeah. <laughs> right. So right, yeah, right. listen, managing uh, the, the right way. Manager would be full of. <laughs> Tree of Heaven, if we didn't take the action. Oh, there's, I agree. There's other so, places in Falls. Hill it is uh, established. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It is noon. Lunch is on, and Teresa has uh, your lunch ready. Peter, you're welcome to stay, even though you may need to push on. Yeah, to if anybody there. wants to take their lunch to go, there are containers. If you prefer to get, got to get back to your town. Let's head up there. All right. I'm. Uh, I'm gonna empty this out over yeah. here. Okay. Can you put it just back in my? And that's it. Tom. Tom. The title of this talk is Tom. Um, this is called the uh, Japanese Knotweed Workshop for the seven towns of the wild and scenic Housatonic from New Milford through Kent, Cornwall, Sharon, Salisbury, Canaan, and North Canaan on September 10th, 2019. The first, possibly the first regional invasive management effort uh, in Connecticut history. Yep, regional and also educational for watch our your town what you're doing. You just yep. let juice out. I'm, I didn't. I well, don't it, I did. it ran out of your stem. Okay, so that's so, it. Yeah, that's hey, it. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, can you put this okay. in my car? Okay.